All right. Um, so hey, everybody. Welcome to the 163rd monthly meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Um, tonight, we're going to be hearing from Thomas Bushnell, who will be introducing us to Ubuntu, uh, Google's take on the Linux desktop. Uh, also, we will be hearing before that a quick lightning talk from David uh, Solomonov, the president of the local New York chapter of the Internet Society. He will be giving us a quick introduction to the Internet Society, how the local chapter fits in, and how you can get involved. So, um, tonight, before we get started, uh, three quick requests. Uh, first, if we could take this time to uh, silence your cell phones, just uh, put them on buzz or whatever you can to, to keep them from interrupting the presentation. Um, second, uh, if we could just put the kibosh on any more uh, coffee machine uh, activity. It's, it's extremely loud and, and uh, you'd be surprised uh, how it can make it difficult to be heard. Um, and, and of course, recorded actually also is another problem. So uh, finally, if you have any questions uh, when the time comes or during the presentation, uh, please raise your hand and wait for someone with a mic. We really want to make sure that we can get your questions and the answers recorded. If that's not possible, if the speaker can just try to uh, repeat your question before they answer it, that'll also work. Um, but it's great if we can get the mic to you. Uh, we'd like to take this time to uh, thank our sponsors at Google for graciously allowing us to use this great space. Um, if you uh, know many Googlers around here, you know, by all means thank them personally. Uh, we'd also like to thank our other sponsors, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, and O'Reilly Media, as well as thank the many NILA volunteers who contributed greatly over the years. Um, tonight, after Thomas gives his talk, we will be giving away some books from Pearson, including books on Ubuntu and some O'Reilly ebook coupons. To win, you will need to answer trivia questions that Thomas will be asking related to the presentation. So, pay attention. Uh, the trivial question will be from the talk, uh, raise your hand, and if he calls on you, and you answer correctly, remember the first part, if he calls on you, shouting out, and it leads to tears, um, you'll win one of our prizes. Um, after the meeting, please join us for uh, just more casual talk and drinks. We're going to be going to McKenna's Pub at 250 West 14th Street, it's on the south side of 14th Street, just off of 7th Avenue. and. Uh, we'll have uh, a few people going across in groups, so you don't have to leave immediately, and you won't get left behind if you want to go. So, uh, a few quick announcements. First off, for anyone who doesn't know already, there is a, a free wireless network that Google provides. If you uh, want to uh, have internet access for your computers or your cell phones, please look for Google Guest. Um, next announcement is that our next workshop is November 20th. Please see Rob Benes or David Bristow after the meeting if you would like to find out more information. Guys, can you raise your hands? All right, and um, so uh, I got a little bit. okay. So uh, you can also always check our meetup page or our website for more information about the uh, um, about those uh, meetings. Um, next month we will be having our annual holiday party. Uh, the details are still being worked out. So feel free to see Brian uh, Gupta over there um, if uh, after the meeting if you're interested in being a co-sponsor for the party. Our next monthly presentation will be in January, and it will cover the Linux file system EXT4 X4, and will be presented by Linux kernel developer uh, Theodora Ted So, Brian will be uh, emailing out a list of next year's meetings following that uh, as they become available. Um, does anyone have any additional announcements that they would like to make? Um, I would like to mention uh, then uh, one quick thing before I give this to you, Ryan. Um, this is our first meeting uh, after uh, Sandy, of course, and uh, a lot of people were affected. I um, want to thank Google for uh, being here for us. And uh, we want to mention also that if anyone is uh, familiar with or friends with Kevin Mark, he's still having some difficulties. So if you want to get in touch with him, either via Rob or, or Brian or anyone else, then um, you know, if you can offer some help for him, that would be great. But uh, this is only for those of you who know him. He's a long time member of the group. Um, Brian? Hey, uh, so a couple of notes on uh, Debian. Um, I've actually rejoined the Debian uh, Developer Conference uh, fundraising team, and we're looking for Debian shops that are interested in helping to sponsor the event. It's going to be uh, next summer in Switzerland. Um, Feel free to ping me if you, uh, if you have, know of any companies that would be interested in getting involved. I also want to mention, this is kind of an interesting Debian topic for me, that they've uh, started work on um, 
cloud AMIs and images for various cloud platforms, and that work is developing. If you're uh, a cloud user and you, you're into this stuff, feel free to, uh, there's a Debian-cloud at list.debian uh, if you want to jump in and get involved. So that's it for me. All right. Um, again, one last call. Any announcements? Anyone else? All right. Um, so with that, let's give a warm welcome to David uh, Solomon from the uh, New York's chapter of the Internet Society.
Um, and we've had a, a kind of close relationship with the free and open source software community, community and the um, free culture community. Uh, in February of uh, 2010, I invited Evan Bowman, who you know, uh, the, uh, who's the founder of the Software Freedom Law Center, the former legal counsel for the Free Software Foundation, to come and give a talk on how cloud computing impacted software freedom, privacy, the security issue, and that type of issue. And uh, he came and gave a, gave a talk uh, and uh, suggested, uh, advocated uh, the, the concept of a freedom box, which would be a small, tiny, inexpensive, user-friendly computer, which would be capable of secure communications, and a decentralized model for social uh, media and social networking. And uh, a couple of people in the audience said, wow, that's really cool. And they went out and did things. They formed it in the Freedom Box Foundation, which is actually doing, working to build the, to, and design the Freedom Box. And also the Diaspora uh, Project, which is a basically an open source, decentralized, secure, privacy-friendly alternative to social media, like uh, Facebook that currently has uh, about a half million uh, users. So uh, th these are kinds of things that we've set in motion. Uh, and we, that's kind of the way we like to do things, to inspire people to get this moving here. Uh, so the question is now, uh, what are we going to do next? Uh, next week, we're sponsoring a, a panel discussion on the so-called Six Stripes uh, initiative. Uh, the major ISPs who are always, have always been pressured to crack down on copyright infringers have agreed to form a consortium. And uh, after six complaints about you uh, supposedly uh, engaging in infringing activities, something bad is supposed to happen to you. So we're certainly concerned about this in terms of how it might affect a fair use, how arbitrary or capricious you know, this kind of enforcement might be, whether it would affect, you know, impact negatively people doing you know, a creative reuse, remixing, mashups, that type of thing. And that will be at the New York Law School. Uh, what's next? Uh, next month, uh, the uh, World Ricket, the World Conference on Information Technology, will be meeting in Dubai, uh, which is basically the, uh, sponsored by the International Telecommunications Union, which goes back to the 19th century, uh, the original telegraph system. Uh, but they, they are you know, now part of the UN and have a lot to do with the standards for telephony and, and uh, the telephone networks. And they would like to get much more aggressively involved in internet governance. Uh, and this, that uh, is being, being, there's a big press, a big push, I guess we would say, from some countries that don't have these democratic institutions that our country does, like Russia and some of the Arab countries, uh, to centralize control and administration of the internet, uh, in, in, you know, ostensibly for law enforcement and security reasons, but specific, actually to censor and surveil at a centralized point. And we're opposed to that, both from the, the human rights standpoint and also just that's not the way the internet is currently architected, and it would just would cause a lot of problems that way. So those are things that we're currently working on. Uh, in the future, the next thing that I'm kind of excited about, I'm working on developing what will initially will be a SIG, a special interest group for, uh, coming out of our New York chapter for augmented and virtual reality. And um, this basically is more and more people spend more of their time in cyberspace and in you know, online gaming virtual environments. Uh, at the same time, we have things like 3D printing, and actually people are now taking objects that they are designed in a virtual world or in online games and actually Print, you know, fabricating them uh, with 3D printers. So we're seeing a lot of different situations where cyberspace and physical space are becoming intertwined. Um, and in addition, uh, there's now a technology that's an early state of this, but basically that would bring the, inter the kind of interconnectivity that we have with the World Wide Web into online games and virtual worlds. Uh, because currently there are siloed uh, and use a lot of proprietary software, but uh, I would like to have us advocated. Yes. Yeah. Okay, sorry, good. Uh, go to the uh, Internet Society website, isoc.org, and from there you can, um, there's a link to become a member. It's just a simple form, and they want your email address and a password that you set up. And you'll be asked to choose a chapter, and you pick out um, New York. And uh, also, yeah, we have uh, announcements for the, our event next week, by the way. Uh, by the book. Um, and also, if you have, want to get in touch with me directly, you can just email me at president at isoc-ny, isoc.ny.org. If you have any cool ideas or want to get involved, you know, just you can drop me a line to it. 
power. So that's basically it. We need, we're a small, we're still a small group. We need lots of help and we can use a lot of input. All right, thank you, David. Yeah. Um, again, everybody, there are uh, five minutes in the seat. Let me uh, grab your mic and you can hand it off to Thomas. All right, everybody. So I've been um, reminded or uh, asked to tell everybody, really, that um, even if you've heard about a similar presentation having happened in the past, that this isn't it. This is all, or at least some of it, most of it, much of it, half of it. Half of it is entirely new material that's never been heard outside of Google before. So um, you, uh, you're the first. Um, everybody, uh, Thomas Bushnell. combination of a low bandwidth, high latency connection. <laughs> and I thought that was a nice, a nice selling point. There we go. So I'm going to talk about Ubuntu GNU Linux at Google. Um, I am the tech lead of the Gubuntu team, uh, one of two tech leads of the Gubuntu team at Google. So we are responsible for Gubuntu, which is just our goofy name for redistributing Ubuntu and adapting it to the environment at Google. Um, I'm going to talk about Ubuntu, what runs, which runs on Linux-based desktops and laptops, and some what we call core servers, um, NTP servers and, and the like in, in offices such as the one you're sitting in. I'm not going to say anything about Google's data centers and production systems, so if you're hoping for that, sorry. Uh, but there's a very nice article you can read in Wired that was recently published. Um, uh, so whatever I say, it's actually not about that. Those are just totally different systems. I'm not going to mention much about other operating systems. There are some people who run Apple products and Windows products for various reasons. So, um, could you move over so you can see the slide in full of this? Okay. There's yeah. other, okay. I mean, there's <laughs> 17 screens with slides. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'm, we use Linux at Google for other things as well, including, of course, Android and Chrome OS, but that's a separate, a separate thing from the routine. So I'll talk about unique challenges that we face in our environment, some of the techniques we use to do systems administration in that environment, meeting those challenges, some case studies of special problems that we've solved, and the kinds of engineering principles that we use at Google to underlie this work and a lot of other stuff. So on to unique challenges. Our user population is tens of thousands of employees. They are not all engineers. They include graphic designers, uh, people who are people managers, software engineers, of course, systems engineers, translators, lawyers, uh, you name it. There are people using Ubuntu at Google. Um, we have people who wrote the original Unix using Ubuntu. We have people who have never heard of what Unix is. We have some of the best programmers in the world among our user base. They can be demanding. And we have some who don't know anything about how computers really work. We push workstations to their limits. We have people who find bugs that only show up with extremely heavy workloads. We have very large code bases that we compile against. We want to support a very rapidly moving development cycle in which Telling people that they have to stop for a little while is a serious problem. We have unusual cost-benefit ratios. Part of this is the standard kind of large installation systems administration, where the, the trade-offs start to cut a different way. But also part of it is unique to, to the kind of organization that Google is. A reboot for us, if we force every Ubuntu workstation with Google to reboot, the rule of thumb is that that costs about a million dollars. Huh? One reboot costs a million dollars. Why is that? Because we've got tens of thousands of engineers who now are losing 15 minutes. Yeah. Right? Now there's a certain about a fudge about that because they can do something else, but there's some kind of but there's a sense in which the time it takes somebody to reboot, especially if 
their, you, their particular desktop environment is one where they've chosen that they need 15 minutes to get all their windows back exactly where they put them. That's, that turns out to be a lot when you multiply it. Google also has a somewhat unique position that we are, we have to exercise appropriate custody of users' data. We have an awful lot of users. And while users' data is not stored on Ubuntu workstations, they are access methods that are used to get to users' data. And so it's extremely, our security is not only for ourselves, but for every user of Google. And that ramps up the scale a lot. Also, this is common for lots of large organizations. Um, supporting old hardware quickly becomes more expensive than buying new. So uh, we typically refresh hardware in about, about two years, more, about, more or less. But an individual engineer may not know that. An individual engineer may be saying, well, you know, I'm fine with my workstation. I don't need a refresh, right? So now we have to support that workstation, which means we have to test on that hardware platform. We have to worry about aging hardware, right? It imposes more costs on, on Canonical, which provides support for us because they now have to worry about the older hardware. Um, so that it quickly becomes more expensive to have 50 people who have not upgraded because they're being frugal, they're actually costing a lot of money. So we have some, some pressures about that. Like a lot of large organizations, we have to integrate with existing systems that we have. We're not just running Ubuntu. <clears throat> so we need to interact with the existing Google authentication systems for user authentication and, and to a lesser extent, authorization. We have existing source code and review systems that we need to integrate with and use for our own work. We're not just in the job of deploying Linux to Google. We're also in the job of supporting Google as a whole and all these other systems that are not just Ubuntu. Some of the special security considerations. One is that we ban packages. Um, while we provide users root on their workstation and they can install anything they want from Ubuntu, we ban certain packages. Those are typically the ones that phone home, right? So we don't want every user's workstation at Google sending Debian popularity contest information, which among other things is going to include custom proprietary packages that we've installed. Um, we don't want users to be accidentally storing their work data in Ubuntu One, right? Ubuntu One is great. I use it at home, but I don't. But we don't want it on on engineers' workstations. We tend to be pushing the state of the art in network authentication. I'll say more about that, but we're using, we want to use TPMs to store wireless credentials on laptops and things like this. And some of this is really brand new and we're, we're writing it as we go. And as I suggested, we're a very high profile security target. Most organizations of 30,000 employees are not as high a profile security target. Our users have high expectations. Oh, we've lost a line on the slide, I'm sorry. Um, well, that, that, that screen on the left, on the right there is losing a little bit. Users expect to be able to create tools and then deploy them to thousands of engineers. Most large installation systems administration do not have half of their users able to make a Debian package. Right? Now we have, now not all of ours believe they're able, but they often ask us to distribute something and we say, Ah, package it up and you can distribute it. <laughs> and then they say, well, I can't package it up. But they are, it turns out, pretty smart and able to do it. You tell them they have to. So we do that. Many of our users know Unix. Most of them, I would say, probably. And they need to be root. They expect to be root. They aren't going to work somewhere where they can't be root. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, they need to have control over their workstations. They're going to be doing things that are just going to require them. We have a high cost for mistakes. That means our mistakes, not our users' mistakes. As I mentioned, if we, if we accidentally make every workstation need to be rebooted, that's high. If we make everybody stop working, that's extremely expensive. We have to support huge perforce code bases using custom build systems. Um, that's a little unusual. Uh, we, we, have, we, we have custom tools to do builds and to do, to do uh, source code management. But at the same time, Android and Chrome are using Git and free software tools because, of course, those are, are free software projects. And so, so the Chrome developers had better be able to use 
Git and the standard Chromium build tools because that's what they use. And the same is true for Android. We have, among those many people who have been using computers as long as uh, then surf, well, you know, right? Uh, every corner case of UI desires and habits, mm -hmm. right? We can't tell them what UI to use. Um, so there will be no one-size-fits-all solution, right? We have to support the diversity of everything you can do on Ubuntu and all the things people wish you could do even though they can't. Okay, how do we administer in that kind of situation. Some of this is standard kind of large installation systems administration stuff. If you go to the, I think Usenix still has Lisa conferences, and you'll, you'll hear papers about how you approach these kinds of problems, and the tools are more and more well known. So if you're in that kind of situation and you know that kind of world, this will, some of this will be old hat to you. Some of what we do is kind of primitive. Um, and at the same time, if you've never seen that kind of thing, I hope you'll get some idea of what, what happens in large installations that you might not see in a smaller situation with a thousand users. How do we deal with package management? We mirror from upstream repositories. We don't connect directly to the upstream repositories. That, among other things, means that our workstations don't grind to a halt if something bad happens to archive.org. We also maintain an internal, I put it in quotes because it's not like it's not Launchpad, but we maintain a, a PPA system for engineers so that anyone at Google can uh, get a PPA and then use it to distribute packages to anyone they want. That produces a lot of relaxation of pressure for my team. Right? If, if somebody believes they have a package that just everybody's going to need, we can tell them to build it, they create a PPA, do it, you publicize it, we're not involved we will offer consulting help, right? That's a, that's a big advantage. We keep things up to date by running app get update and upgrade like everybody else does, or really just upgrade. We don't use the standard Ubuntu uh, unattended upgrades tool, uh, but we essentially do the same kind of task. We practice, we're very interested in fault tolerance and learning from mistakes. So these upgrade tools, for example, and package management tools are designed mostly as a matter of learning from mistakes and adding a little bit more to deal with it, uh, to cope with bad packages that might have shown up in the repository, dependencies that can't be satisfied, app repositories that might be gone, breakage in the tool that is used to do the updates. So for example, the, the cron job that kicks off the tool does not just kick off our updater tool. The first thing it does is an app get update, it doesn't care if it fails, it just tries. The next thing it does is it tries to do an app get install of the package that holds the upgrade tool. It doesn't care if it fails, it just tries. That means that if there's some kind of bug in the update tool, the cron will just have a, there will be a little hope of that cron job catching it up. I'll talk more about what it's like when things break, and I have a case study of that. Every now and then we have to do emergency package pushes. Um, we need to push a package immediately. We have some mechanisms for doing that that come outside of our normal administration channels. And we also have to be able to override upstream repositories. For example, suppose there's an emergent security issue and we need to, to push our package out ahead of Canonical pushing the package out. Or even more interesting from a Debian standpoint, suppose Canonical has just pushed a new Ubuntu package that has a small bug that's hurting us. And it's hurting us in a way that it's enough it's important enough that we need to stop it immediately, right? Well, a whole bunch of workstations have already installed the bad package, so we need to get the old version and put it in a repository that's pinned extremely high, right? AppGet lets you pin repositories, and if you pin it at a priority of over 1,000, it will forcibly downgrade the package. So we use that to be able to recover, but you have to have that ahead of time. It's too late <laughs> to put that into place once the thing has happened. So you have to already have that repository there, even if nothing's in it. Then we use Puppet. This is not a, a mysterious tool. Puppet is CF engine that works, is the way I describe it to somebody. If you've not used it, it's an automated configuration management tool. What's nice and different about it is that you, it, the model, it's not always like this in every detail, but the model is that you describe what the system ought to be like. 
rather than describing recipes for how to change the system from a known state to a new state. Right? So you just tell it, this file needs to exist, it needs to have this contents, Puppet will keep track of the hash of the file and make it, you know, fix it up. It supports templated files. Um, so it's a pretty flexible system. It's written in Ruby, which has pluses and minuses. Um, one of the pluses is that because it's a real programming language, you can get out to Ruby and do things in Ruby when you need to. Right? So even if you don't like Ruby, at least it's a programming language, rather than just a complicated script that doesn't really have any kind of programming tools. It's hugely used and externally supported, so it's pretty reliable. Um, the basic way that it works, my last bullet point there, machines use a program called Factor, that's not a misspelling, to, well it is, but you know, the people who did it <laughs> chose it. Um, it's called that because the machine computes facts about it. Um, not about its current state, but about what kind of machine it is. And then those facts get sent up to the server, and the server compiles a manifest which goes back to the client, which then makes the machine look like the server says it should look like. So what do we do specifically with it? Well, we configure configuration files just like you would have done by hand in slash Etsy. So that's, you know, 90% of it is just that. We use it to require packages, to, to force packages to be installed, and we use it to purge packages if we've banned them and they shouldn't be installed. Some of the configuration that it imposes is mandatory. For example, if there's a security rule. Right? So we install gconf and deconf rules to force the use of a screensaver that locks after 10 minutes. Users can't override that, and if they remove the files to do it, Puppet will simply always install them. <coughs> Some of the configuration we put in place, but it's perfectly fine if users change it. And other times we create what we call a knob, which is just a devconf variable that the user says how they want their system to be, and we have some like preset ways. And often there's a knob that says, and just leave it alone, is one of the options. So that lets users have a measure of control over things that they don't want Puppet to change while enabling us to configure the vast majority of machines that way. So for example, we do that for X configuration. There's no security issue about X configuration. It's a pain to get right. Getting it wrong is bad. It's our job to give people a working X configuration for standard monitor setups that we're going to support. And there will be people with weird, crazy monitor setups, so they need to be able to set this knob and say, leave, I'm going to have my own X configuration, leave it alone. Did you have a question? Quick question. You mentioned users are uh, root. So yeah. how do you prevent users getting uh, puppet agents to prevent the screensaver lock-in feature? We pay them. <laughs> no, that's the short answer, right? <laughs> uh, they, they could also, they could also, hi, uh, you know, we don't have the security guy downstairs um, is not going to prevent you from bringing in a hitman. If a Googler chooses to bring in a hitman to kill a fellow employee, they can sign them in on the badge. There's no method, right? So we rely on our, on our uh, there's a lot of ways users could screw over, the, our, our employees could screw over the company if they chose to, right? This is hardly the most important one. What we think is really important is making it so that when users do that, they know they're doing it. We don't want people to accidentally do that, right? So we, that's where we focus our energy. We don't focus our energy like you might at a university on preventing people who are malicious, right? If they were going to be malicious toward the company, Turning off the screen lock is hard like weather. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's your polling interval and how many backend servers do you have running public? The question is what's the polling interval and how many backend servers do we have? Um, we, we run twice a day. Okay. Twice a day. And we have end servers. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so, how do we do release engineering? We have a semi monthly release cycle. And in that release cycle is where we roll out new versions of the packages that my team builds and our Puppet configuration. We do a two-stage release testing. So the first thing that happens is we, we, we the, the actual repository and Puppet code is continually being changed by team members. Right? So we, we, we cut a release so that we have a determinate fixed thing. We call that unstable. We test it. We find lots of bugs. We fix them. Then we cut it to testing, 
Testing is really not for users to test. I'll talk about how you, make, how you get users to test. But it's, it's for other teams that have to integrate with us, right? Or really core corp servers that want to that wanna heads up. And then after it runs for a few days and it seems okay, we push it out to the fleet. We use a standard thing called auto-test. You, you can look that up. It's not very good, but it's a tool that does whole system testing. And there aren't very many good systems that do unattended whole system testing. Um, and we've got a whole bunch of wrapper around it in order to automatically pixie boot machines off the network and stuff like this, um, which is one of the things it has to do. We need to test on a, basically a full matrix of all the hardware that we support. And since right now we're transitioning from Lucid to Precise, we have to support we have to test every. We have to have two copies of all of those machines so that we can test it on Lucid and we can test it on Precise. Uh, we both test installs, brand new install, and we test upgrades from whatever the previous stable was because lots of bugs manifest in one or the other. What about packages from elsewhere? Packages that that are not maintained by my team are not part of that release cycle, so they're just installed the way they normally would be out of a repository, right? They, whether that, that's true whether they come from uh, Canonical or Ubuntu or uh, the PPAs that we have internally for, user, for uh, users. Um, we have some filtering that happens on packages as they come in. We have some security checks that get run on them before they get pushed out. Uh, more and more of that over time. We have a reboot filter, for example. Um, there are certain Ubuntu maintainers, Debian maintainers really, I think, in this case, who believe that their package really needs to request a reboot every single time it installs. One of those is the SSL libraries. On the theory that you might be running a web server, and the new SSL library might have a security fix that's important to your web server. None of our workstations are running Apache, and none of them are running HTTPS. We don't need it. <laughs> but because Debian lets any package declare, I need a reboot, and because the Ubuntu UIs front that flag directly to the user interface, a little pop-up that says, you need to reboot. We have a little filter in place that checks every package that comes in to see if it's doing, if it's asking for a reboot, and if it does, we, we, we let the package out, but we interfere with its ability to ask for a reboot until we whitelist it. Um, that's, that's kind of a, that's a, a little bit of a rat hole explanation, but it's the kind of thing that we need to do when we, when we incorporate packages. We also have some special package delivery mechanisms that are completely outside the app get um, cycle. Um, and we have, as I said, a custom PPA mechanism. It ain't very sophisticated. If you want a custom PPA system and you don't want to build one, my advice is to do something like Launchpad. What we've got is rep repro with a bunch of hand scripts and some user intervention. It's not pretty. It's not pretty. But it predates being able to run Launchpad. Also, release engineering is involved with emergency responses. We need to be able to push packages immediately. We can do that either through the repos or we can do that through the other package delivery mechanisms we have. As I mentioned earlier, we have a very highly pinned override repository that lets us forcibly downgrade any package. We need to be able to, pack, to fork a package very quickly if there's a security response that's necessary. That's typically pretty quick and dirty. So the, the most important thing is to make sure that, it's gotten, that it was correct and that it's been checked into some source code control somewhere so that people can figure out what's going on after they wake up the next day. Um, one of the things we do that's interesting also in this response is, is we can test our puppet config with an ad hoc puppet master. So we have some scripts that will set up a puppet master on any workstation you like, complete with little certificate authority and so forth, and then we can run our update tool and point it at that test puppet master. And that lets you verify that your changes don't break. Um, it's it's kind of tedious. It's kind of tedious. And I put it here because we don't necessarily do it every time we check in any change of puppet. We rely on our release engineering to catch to catch uh, mistakes. But if you're doing an emergency push, you don't have you don't have the luxury of a two week release cycle. Okay, moving on to another decision we've made uh, beyond how we do release engineering. Um, why do we use the long-term support release? Um, well, the answer is that upgrading is really expensive. We have hundreds of locally built packages, and a lot of them will need to change anytime there's a new release. 
Even small changes can be really expensive. A small change will require, might even show up as a bug and that would be really annoying. So the development cycle is several months for us to get ready for, to even have precise running. Um, a new release, if it comes every, every six months, there will be changes that happen to be destabilizing for us and they don't have an obvious benefit. So we, get, so we, we, we take a hit any time we upgrade, right? One of the things that really matters to a lot of Ubuntu users in general is the very nice release cadence that gives you the new UI all the time. You get the latest KDE and the latest GNOME and the latest whatever, right? Um, that's less important to us, right? We're willing to put up with it just staying the same and being old and cruddy. It's not the ideal situation, but that's one of the big draws to the regular twice a year cycle for Ubuntu, and it just turns out not to be a win for us. <coughs> and we have to have a very cautious adoption and phase and process of them, right? It's going to take months and months. So it's not something that we can do twice a year. There are disadvantages to using the long term. Just as we don't, just as we, we are insulated from destabilizing changes we don't care about, well, there may be some change we do care about that would be destabilizing to somebody else. And a great example of this was the situation with KDE and Lucid. When, when 1004 was cut, KDE came out with the next with KDE4 like a month or two months later. And so Lucid was on KDE3 for two years, right? And um, that became a great advantage to, to get people to switch to Precise. KDE users at Google were really happy because with Precise, suddenly they got KDE5 and they didn't feel like they were left behind. They felt like they were on the cutting edge finally, right? So that if the cadence, if the, if the Ubuntu cadence doesn't exactly match their upstream cadence, you can get that kind of really unfortunate situation where you have something that's not just two years old, but really, really four. Um, we can't participate in the Ubuntu cadence as much as we'd like. We typically sort of spin up heavy involvement with Ubuntu development every other year. Uh, we'd like to be able to do that more frequently. Um, it becomes harder and harder for upstream to support older and older releases. And a particular problem is when new hardware comes out. We, there, was a, there was a real catch up when, when Sandy Bridge came out. And laptop manufacturers were not going to provide non-Sandy Bridge laptops. And Lucid, Lucid did not run on Sandy Bridge hardware. Right. And, yeah, and I gotta tell you, Canonical really stepped up and did an awesome job of supporting it. But we were months away <laughs> from getting no more laptops that we could give out to new employees. <laughs> So what does it take for us to upgrade to a new LTS? Why is it really that painful when you can do your own upgrade to every six months with one command? Why don't we just have our users run do release upgrade? First of all, making Ubuntu work on a new release takes several months. We need to discover changes, and it's mostly discovering them because we can't go through every change and think about whether it will affect us. There's a lot of time to find and fix bugs, and then we need to do security review. So we need to have our, the Google security team go and do a review of the, whole new, of the whole new release. We need to spin up release engineering resources. We need to get new hardware in place to do testing. We need to get new allocations of physical space in a lab and networking switches in order to have our test lab have the new hardware that we need to start running tests on it. We need to recruit a population of early testers at Google who will be engineers who are willing to run something that's going to break. And they need to be some of the people who are working on the core build tools and software that all the engineers use. So that can be hard and we need buy-in from them. Once that's ready, then, then once the, the release happens, we can enable it for users at Google. So how did this go? We started work on Precise immediately after Oniric was cut. So that's when Precise repos went live, and they were cloned from Oniric and Debian. And then we started in sync with Ubuntu's development with our work. We had test users well before Precise was released by Ubuntu. And then when it was released, we enabled it for users a few weeks later. We did one release cycle, and we pushed it out. It then took about two months before we made it the default for new installs. So that's June. Then we need to start deprecating the old. We're about halfway done now. Okay. 
So we ex our target is the end of January. Okay, that's, that's nine months after the release from Ubuntu. Then we need to break the old so that we force users to upgrade. That's another month. But then there will be people who have been given an exemption because they have some critical need. So we can't actually remove the old version until probably next summer. Okay? So that's about 14 months. That will give about one quarter of breath before it's time <laughs> to do the next every other year LTS. So we can't possibly spend the resources to do that every six months. What kind of hardware do we run? We prefer Ubuntu certified hardware because then we have some confidence that, that it really will work and we're not going to spend our time chasing down hardware bugs. Or that if we do, it's going to be unusual rare cases that nobody would have run into. That does happen. Right? We, we definitely had a bug on T3500s that only happened because we have a fleet of tens of thousands of them. So something that happened a tenth of a percent of the time was well important enough to be on our radar screen. But nobody would have found it in regular kind of system validation testing. Um, when we get new hardware to validate, we do what you'd expect. We test and validate the key features of the hardware, make sure it works, and repeat the kind of thing that, that Ubuntu does. But we also care about hardware that a lot of enterprises might not care so much about. We care a lot about audio and cameras because we do a lot of video conferencing. People do it at their desk and their workflows are critically dependent on it. We care a lot about unusual USB devices and weird little uh, special cryptographic memory sticks and all kinds of stuff like this that a lot of places aren't using. And we have a lot of Android developers who need to be able to plug these in <laughs> and speak over their weird little USB uh, method, and, and that's pretty crucial. So what's different about Ubuntu? If you, if you log into Ubuntu, what does it look like? What's the desktop look like? Can I get it? It looks like Unity. <laughs> it looks like Unity because we're not spending our time making a new desktop, right? Um, we finally got a custom wallpaper. <laughs> but it wasn't us who did the custom wallpaper. It was the user support guys. We call them field tech. Right? It was the user support guys who wanted a custom wallpaper that would like have their phone number and their web page and their map and, and all that kind of stuff. Right? And they wanted to have it on all the platforms, not just Ubuntu. Right? So there, we finally got a custom desktop. Right? That's it. You get a, you get a, a, a nicely designed uh, custom background. Um, in the ways people, most people in the world care about, it's just Ubuntu. Right? The details to the user are not that different, and most of our users' main complaint is when Ubuntu isn't exactly what they want it to be, and they can complain loudly and explain why it, everybody should rationally recognize it should be different. It's very helpful that there's always somebody who has the exact opposite view, who's equally vociferous, and if we can just get them to talk together. <laughs> So what do we do? We ju it's just Ubuntu with our own systems management and then some special packages. There's some really cool stuff in those packages. They only make sense if you're in our infrastructure. Right? If you don't have the particular service that we have for them to talk to, they're useless to you. Right? Um, and, and of course, they're often highly proprietary, but at the same time, it wouldn't be any good to you. Right? If I could run it on my desktop at home, it would just sit there unable to contact all the servers that would do something cool. Okay, so what are some special problems that we have to confront? Here's a hypothetical emergency response situation. A day zero security vulnerability has been discovered by a Google security engineer. We're, what is my team going to do? Well, first thing we're going to do is we're going to figure out what's the risk. Right? We're going to work together with security team on the risk and what kinds of mitigation there may be. It may not be clear how to fix the bug yet. Lots of times it's clear that there's a a bug and an exploit, but it's not at all clear what the, what the fix should be. So you need to get a workaround in place. We're going to build a fix package and we're going to deploy it to the fleet immediately and we're going to have to monitor uptake and make sure that all the machines across the fleet are doing it. So we have a lot of fleet monitoring software and it's going to try to keep track and make sure that we're reasonably good on uptake. Then we're also going to have to coordinate with upstream. We're going to have to say, hey, there's this bug. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> right? And then we're going to coordinate with them on embargo, and they're going to get it out, and they're going to talk to them, and, and, and 
secure security team will be involved and sometimes directly agree with us about what the patch ought to be or we'll say we think this is the patch but you know you go ahead and fix it how you think best and then when they when they when they put their security patch out now everybody on Ubuntu has the fix we're going to need to pull the special replacement package that we slammed in on top of everything so that the standard version is there and then we can back out all of the work that we spent 20 hours doing and throw it away Another story, what happened the day cron broke? A couple of years ago, there was a mistake in a new version of cron that uh, Ubuntu pushed. Um, it interacted badly with the way the NSS libraries were there. They didn't cons the, whoever did it did not think clearly about the case where the NSS libraries <coughs> needed to get reloaded. It's an unusual situation because these are shared libraries that are not only loaded at program startup, but they get loaded and unloaded as things run. So the new, the new library, I think it was the push of the NSS libraries, and, and uh, they couldn't be loaded into an existing program that had already started up with the previous version of the libraries in place. And one such program was cron, which cares about this because cron needs to set the user ID of the jobs that it spins off. And the problem was that when, the bug, when you updated your NSS libraries, the next time cron wanted to do a set new ID, it would crash. Well, this is a special kind of failure because all of your automatic update facilities depend on cron. They're kicked off by cron. So if cron isn't running, kind of stuff, what do you do? How do you solve this problem? Well, we have an army of, of awesome field techs. We could just send them out <laughs> and do nothing for two weeks. Right? It, it, even when you have an army of awesome field techs, they don't exist in such numbers that they can go out and reboot every workstation. It's not even clear that our infrastructure is going to be happy with 20,000 workstations all rebooting at once. <clears throat> Massive user education campaign. We start putting out posters and phone calls and stuff like this, and then three weeks later, no, it can't work, right? Um, and what about stragglers? What about machines that we failed to, to uptake? How do we get all the last ones updating again? And while these machines aren't updating, we're in a vulnerable security situation. Because if that's the time when now we need to push something that's a security issue, we, we can't adapt, right? We're suddenly frozen. Well, we were lucky. We happened, for other reasons, to have a separate package installation channel available to us. So we created a package whose sole job was to have a post ins that restarted Chrome. We pushed that package out to the fleet. Now it happened that that upgrade, that that particular technology only existed on about 80% of our fleet, but that was okay, right? It's, it still became a game of catch up, but we were able to make progress because we happened to have these other tools around and we happened to have people to figure out how to deploy and use them effectively on a speedy basis. And then there was a long process of monitoring and catching stragglers and, and looking for machines that were fake, they were not, they were running. The user might not even know that it's not updating, right? Just cron isn't running. And on a user workstation, not much depends on that. Right? So we needed to find a way of catching machines that have failed to run cron, have failed to update for a while. I mentioned we have hardware struggles. Users who hang on to old hardware, they impose a support cost. You have to balance the cost of new hardware against supporting older over rarer and rarer hardware. Um, likewise, user choices about hardware can be expensive. Um, and at the same time, we want to give our users choices about hardware. So there's a, people have a choice of a variety of workstations they can get. Um, people have a choice of a variety of laptops they can get, but it's not completely unrestricted. Yeah. Are, are there any cases where you know, users, let's say a newly acquired company or for a new business, where their needs are um, outside of the scope of what you've already uh, certified? Oh yeah. So there's a, that, that's just a, a, a process, right? There, there, are, there are whole teams of people at Google who are, you know, acquisition merging people at the tech level, right? Um, they come in with the printers. They come in with the Ubuntu workstations, because pretty much people just kind of get Ubuntu. Bing, there's your new workstation, right? The harder problems, if you've acquired a web company, are their servers, right? It's their production infrastructure where the really hard problems lie. 
you can take a little while to migrate their user infrastructure for their for their developers. But that turns out not to be a giant problem. But they, yeah, they don't. Uh, pretty much, they get our standard stuff. You know, they, they set up a micro kitchen and they put out the Google printer, with the little printer sign, and the whole thing. It's just like, Bing! This office comes in and they do so this. So you're with someone who needs like six monitors and uh, a special uh, fingerprint device or something like that. Because we let you be root, and because these are all things you can configure, go to it. We're not going to support it for you. But yeah, if Ubuntu works with your fingerprinty thing, you're fine. If you've got an xconfig that works on your 17 monitors that you need, go for it. Yeah. OK. Another particular challenge that we have is forking upstream packages. This is a case where we don't have a good answer, though we know they exist. We just don't have good answers. We don't have anything in place. What we do now is we have is if we want to fork, say, CSH, let's say there's a trivial bug in CSH, um, we should be able to fix it. It's a one-line easy change, but it's not very important to us, right? So we're not going to do the kinds of the kinds of bending over backward that we would do for critical security issue. Well, first we need to check the whole thing, the whole source package, into our source code control system. And our current way of doing it is we check the Debian source package, which is to say the tar, the origin.tar.gz, and the Debian diff. And then we have a tool which is going to do dpackage build package for that. Okay, so what, how do we do our change? Well, we need to write a patch that's going to get applied to that. Now, suppose the Debian package is quilt. So what our patch is going to do is it's going to be a patch that creates a new quilt patch file. Okay, so it's a two-level, it's a second-degree patch. Okay, so that patch is going to get checked into our source control system, which means it's a diff against the previous version. So it's actually a, a third-order patch. In my experience, no human being can look at the resulting third order diff with a plus, minus, plus, and a plus, plus, minus, and figure out what on earth this patch does, right? So it's already a nightmare. And then, well, we want to have the next version of CSH just kind of automatically get folded into this, right? Now you might say, well, golly, people have solved this problem. Of course they have. Launchpad has a perfectly acceptable solution to this, right? So this is a case of it's not even important to us to solve these kinds of bugs to figure out the right way to organize this process because we're just busy with higher priority tasks, right? So we get stuck. We just, we just tell the person who has a little bug with CSH, yes, you're right, it's a one-line fix. <laughs> we're not pushing a fixed, fixed package, right? And what, what are we going to do? Oh, if they wind it up, we'll open a support case with Canonical and we'll say, this isn't very important, right? <laughs> Put it on your list, it's low priority, <laughs> right? And they, quite appropriately, also have more important things to work on. And so there it sits. You, you don't just direct them to upstream? We, well, we, our team is happy to direct them to, we, we will file the bug upstream. And we will escalate the support case. Yeah. Um, or we will ask them to, or, or whatever seems right under the case. Yeah. But, but none of those things are likely to result in an actual fixed CSH on their system. Um, like I said, these are not solvable problems. But with the current situation that we've got, we don't have a solution to this problem in place, and we just punt, unless it's a critical situation. Special network security issues. Managing physical network devices is hard. All the little things that might be plugged into the wall, you don't know where the Cylons have been. Okay. One solution is to use 802.11x. This is a, essentially an Ethernet standard that provides for cryptographic security on the ports. So the device needs to prove its possession of a certificate in order to be given <coughs> network routing. So that's a great solution. We don't have it in place yet we'd like to. We can use TPMs for remote access credentials so that if you stole my laptop, you'd say, aha, I can VPN into Google. Uh, not likely. Not likely, because you, you, you'd have, you, you can't get the key off of the laptop. Right? The, the key is actually living in a TPM, and the TPM is designed so that with an electron microscope, you can't extract the key. Yeah. Um, couldn't you also um, have Google uh, revoke it as soon as you report your laptop stolen too? Yes, revocation is, is, is important. And that would happen as well. There's a gap. 
and we don't want to gap it. So, yeah. So doing this kind of thing with networks is not free. Now there's a certificate management problem, right? Um, you know, somebody had a security issue, so they decided they'd do certificates, and now they have two security issues. <laughs> um, you have a challenge about attestation, right? The, the client workstation is going to need to attest that it is secure to the network. Well, how do you trust that, right? So that's based on whether our update tools have been running, and that's the best we can do, right? It's not a, it's not a rigid solution. Then you need to isolate machines that don't work and detect them and monitor them, and then the bullet point that got left off of the screen here is remediation. When the workstation has been punted off the network because it hasn't been getting updates and the field tech has come and has fixed it so that it now gets updates, well it needs to have some kind of network, just not the trusted network. And then it needs to get switched back. So this is all a lot of infrastructure that's pretty tricky to get into place and to get right. Challenges testing a system like this. How do you boot a broken laptop remotely when there's no serial console? Recently, laptop manufacturers have started to put into BIOS the necessary feature to have them automatically boot over the network on power up. And you can enable that on the most modern laptops. This is new. And when we were confronting this, we had a lab, we had a bunch of laptops. If I'm the release engineer and I'm in Los Angeles and the lab is Mountain View and that laptop has crashed and won't boot, I need to stay on IRC to get some, one of my teammates to walk upstairs to the lab to push the power button. So we were talking with Canonical, who also has this problem, and they had come up with the same awesomely horrible solutions as us. Well, we thought about designing a little solenoid system that would push the button. <laughs> well, well, we also thought about popping the buttons off and wiring something up, but now you have the problem that you may have broken the hardware. Now, right, did the hardware fail to boot because you broke it, <laughs> or did it fail to boot because you got a bug, right? Uh, the only way we solve this problem is that the newer hardware, as I said, now has a BIOS feature <laughs> that lets the, the laptops can boot, can automatically power up and boot off the network. Fine. Um, whole system testing is slow. It takes an hour, half an hour to an hour to install a machine from packages. We have an image-based method also, but we need to test both. Most bugs that you have manifest as the machine did not install correctly and you have to go look at logs and figure out why. Like if you have a typo in your puppet manifest, the machine will fail to install correctly because the, the initial puppet run will get an error. Now you have to go diagnose that. So it's not like you, your testing grid, the, the little purple box is in the fail to install spot every time for almost all the bugs. Um, maintaining a complete hardware log, lab is expensive. Right? That's one of the reasons that it's expensive to have a lot of aging hardware around that you don't have many users of. Then you can, you can do continuous testing every time a, a, a you, you can do continuous testing where you run, this, you run the tests on the current development copy of all the stuff. And as soon as the testing finishes, you now run another round of tests. The problem is by the time that round of tests has happened, a whole bunch of people have checked in their changes and they're not necessarily all looking at that dashboard. And the person who is has a hard time figuring out what change caused the failure. Okay then, run your test suite every time a change is checked in. Now you have trouble keeping up. Now you need a much bigger lab. <laughs> and then testing UI features is really, really hard. Right? The most we can really do is test that LightDM started. And that tells us that X didn't crash and things like that. But Looking to see that Chrome rendered sensibly is not something we're in a position to do. Um, so we just hope. Yeah. You said your system is uh, via image based and package based. Or is that custom or are you using something like Cobbler? It's custom. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. The question was we also have an image based install. And, and, and did we use Cobbler or something custom? And, and we use something custom. We just we, run, we spin up a KVM, we do an install in it. We pick apart all the things that are now wrong, <laughs> and then we and then we have use precedes to put that in in place of the usual package installation. I ask a question too. Yeah. Um, isn't this sort of like uh, for for a large set of packages? Isn't this an ideal um, sort of a virtual machine environment a sort of a test case? Yes, and we would like to be able to test to to automate our testing with virtual machines. We're not in a position to do that right now. Um, but we're planning, we're planning on doing some of that. Yeah, in fact, that's awesome because then we can clone them and, uh, and 
not have to, not have to, most of the tests, most of the bugs that happen um, would also manifest on an upgrade, for example. And so uh, you could just clone a good machine and run the upgrade, and that could be fast. Um, yeah? So, so, so you, you said you can um, you can use virtual machines and you can and you use Puppet. Uh, did, does the Puppet and the virtual machines integrate? You know, could, could you say, well, okay, so I have 16 of these uh, uh, of, of these files that can be updated. Maybe it's cheaper to to, to just uh, blast an image or, or, or create an image, you know, create various images. Um, does, 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 does the does the images integrate with Puppet? No. I mean, in part that's because Puppet is once the system's installed. So Puppet doesn't run inside Debian installer. It, it's, uh, so we, run, we do a Puppet run once the system has already been installed. So the image, the image install happens way before. Right? The saving that the image install gets us is not downloading all the packages and unpacking them at a time. Right? Um, so we could, I suppose, install a minimal machine and use Puppet to install all the rest of a big tarball. But it's easier to just have DI directly install the whole tarball, which is what we did. Um, oh, I should mention, I, I, somebody uh, once asked this question of me um, before I segue to the next section. Um, when there's a, there's, a, the, there's, a, there's a risk associated with any system like Puppet. And the risk is that the Puppet server can be pwned, right? So if the Puppet server or your traffic to the Puppet server is pwned, it's now an evil Puppet Master, and <laughs> the results, yeah. Um, and, and so, of course, what do you do for, for situations like this? You use certificates, and of course, now you have another certificate management problem. Um, and uh, we, we even had a case where our internal certificate authority for the certificates that dealt with Puppet was being changed. So now we had, and, and we were sort of caught off guard by the change, and so we had to really rapidly. The last thing you want to do is, is have a certificate management problem, especially if you have to change it rapidly. Okay. So how do we, what, what are the kinds of engineering principles? This is now a little more general section. This is not just my team. This is. Um, what we call site reliability engineering at Google in general. It's a category that Google, in a certain sense, invented, certainly, certainly under that name. Um, people were doing these kinds of things for a long time, but making them the standard expected way that you do everything that you thought was systems administration but isn't actually. So the, a site reliability engineer needs to be a good systems engineer and a good software engineer. The job of an SRE is to automate things, to make things happen automatically. Not to be really good at pushing buttons and turning handles, but to automate the system so that nobody is pushing the button or turning the handle. The goal is to manage very large systems with small but very highly skilled teams rather than larger but lower skilled teams. The first and most important motto, hope is not a strategy. And the reason is that computer systems fail. And most systems administrators, me included, always treated system failure as a kind of exceptional event. Oh no, the system failed. Right? Really, they all fail. There is no, your, if your strategy is to make one that won't fail, you're really just hoping that it won't fail, and that's not a strategy. Yours fail. <laughs> now, my, my home desktop is a computer system. It fails. And I mostly ignore that possibility and hope it won't. And that's a reasonable strategy when there's one of me and one of the computer. OK? It stops being a reasonable strategy when I'm, my team is supporting 30,000 odd Googlers and the Gmail SRE team is supporting you know, several orders of magnitude more than that. So you design as if failure is an ordinary kind of event. It's an expected event. It's not an exceptional event. 
When failure happens, you already know what failure is, what it looks like, why it's happening. You plan so that, so that, when, so that you handle failure at some other time than at an emergency. Right? So you don't handle disk full when the disk is full and you have to do it right now. Instead, you have some kind of monitoring to let you know when the disk is going to be full, and you have a great graph that tells you exactly how many hours you have so that you can just schedule it as an ordinary work task that week. And to make that work, you better have really good active monitoring. Right? If you don't want to hope, you have to monitor. Right? Just ask a surgeon, or even better, ask an anesthesiologist. Yeah. They learned it from pilots. Huh? They learned that from pilots. Yeah, from pilots, right? Pilots, uh, the aerospace industry has a very similar attitude. My roommate is a space scientist, right? Now he's a geologist, but he knows how flight hardware and all this stuff happens, even though he doesn't have to get directly involved with it. And they have orders of magnitude more of this kind of engineering thinking than Google does. So if you really love this way of thinking, go, go work for NASA. Um, though the programming for NASA isn't as awesome. Because the, the prestige job at NASA is not the, not the programmer. It's the, the, my roommate, the geologist. OK. So engineers make mistakes too, right? Um, all of them, right? <laughs> all of them. The thing that distinct yeah. Google has had some, some, some public outages in which you saw the public postmortem written, right? And there are people in the press who think, wow, so Google makes mistakes. Uh, Facebook doesn't make mistakes. <laughs> no, of course not. No, it's just that, it's just that of course they do. It's, it's a matter of corporate strategy to what extent you're going to talk about them. Mm -hmm. But all of the engineers in all of the companies are all making mistakes including you and the people you work with make mistakes, right? That means it's not bad. It's okay to make mistakes. So what do you do about it? You find cause of errors, not blame. That's really important. It's just also called being a nice person. But in, but in corporations, it sometimes gets left aside. So what, some of the principles that we have at Google, one of them is that anyone can request a postmortem after an event. Postmortems are not a punitive thing that managers impose on teams to justify their continued existence after something broke. Postmortems are typically things that ordinary engineers are interested in reading about so that they can avoid making the same mistakes in their team. If that culture is really set up, then your postmortem can discuss in a straightforward and rational way what happened, when it happened, and why. With the IRC logs of the engineers who were talking about it at the time, with the exact numbers of this change was pushed, and this change was pushed, and this network link went down, and whatever it is. And then a discussion of what safeguards, if only we had had them in place, would have helped. What made our response slower than it otherwise could have been? And what systems would have made the people or the systems involved less prone to fail in this kind of way? The goal is not to prevent mistakes from happening, but to make sure that each kind of mistake happens only once. And finally, note that human and system error typically look the same. So a, a system which is monitored and able to detect bizarre and unusual system failures like a, a, an animal falling across a power junction and bringing a data center down, say, looks very much the same as a human being accidentally controlling power wrong and bringing a data center down. They, they look the same, and the way you mitigate, detect, resolve, address, it's all the same. So a good way of dealing with human error and a good way of dealing with system error are virtually identical. Another motto, automate yourself out of a job. Human beings do not exist to turn cranks and push buttons. Human beings exist to solve interesting and difficult problems, and computers are awesome at turning cranks and pushing buttons for you. So if what you do is you get page number 17, and every time you get page number 17, you go push button 6, and it's in your playbook. And you get page 17, push button 6. 
and you just always do exactly the same thing. So much that you can tell the newbie, that's what you do, you don't even have to look at it. Why haven't you created something that catches the condition, pushes button six, and doesn't leave, get a human involved at all? A lot of times people will say, oh, well, it's because we want to know if it's happening too much. Oh, fine, page on that. All right. In the past week, this alert condition happened more than 20 times. And then you can just do it in your ordinary course of events rather than as a sudden thing that requires an immediate response. At the same time, the number, ideal number of pages is zero. The ideal number of pages is two a day. If you have two pages, two pages a day, then one guy carrying a beeper, if it takes four hours to address an interesting problem, one guy carrying a beeper can keep your system running. That's your operational load. Right? And that should be able to address all of the pages you get. That should be true. That, is, I, that should be true completely independent of the size of the service or the number of users it serves. That means that while Gmail might need more SREs to, do, to write interesting software to do automation, they should not need more people to carry beepers and push buttons. They only need one guy whose job is to get to it. Right? Or at least that's the target. That's the target. So when somebody has automated themselves out of a job, you then have to not fire them. That requires a certain attitude towards management culture. Oh, you've proven you were doing a useless job all along. No, it has to be, wow, you're awesome at automating yourself out of a job. Please now automate this team out of their job, and then teach this team how to automate themselves out of this job, so all of these talented engineers can now do something way more awesome than what they've been doing. Um, how do you test things if you really want to be sure that it's going to work and not break the world? You don't have a, te a test pool. A test pool is where a bunch of people agree, yeah, I'll be a tester, and they run the test version, and then after they don't have a problem, you push it out to the world. Right? That's insufficient. It's fine to do it, it's insufficient. Because they are not normal people. They are the kind of people who say, yeah, I'll do it. There's also an interesting psychology, which is that if you know that you're a tester and you know that you're running a test version, you become less likely to report problems. Because you assume that problems are expected and surely they already know about it, and right, you don't get good bug reports from testers. Testers deliberately, consciously self-censor. And even when I know this, when I'm a tester of, say, a new Android thing or whatever, I do the same stupid thing myself. Oh, surely they already know about this thing. Right? No. <laughs> so test pools are not sufficient. They're good to have, but they're not sufficient. And they're not very good at distinguishing their own personal preferences from bugs. Oh, I think you should have put the button over there, and this should have been a darker shade of purple. <laughs> Right? So you get mixed in with not enough bugs, you get a lot of non-bugs that may be useful advice, but they're not what the testers are there for. <clears throat> so we use canary. Metaphor is, of course, the canary in the cold mine. It's a way to push out new versions above and beyond using testers. What you do is you automate a push to a small number of randomly chosen users, real ordinary users who don't know they're a canary. You have to do it in such a way that you can watch them and see whether something is happening that you didn't want and that you can back it out quickly if it is. Right. What other mechanism could a company like Google use to push out a new search algorithm? Right? Let's just push this out to everybody and hope the revenue doesn't evaporate for a day is not a reasonable approach. Right? You better push things out slowly and watch very carefully what's happening and ramp it up over time. It's not something Google invented by any means, but it's something that we try to do in almost every way. Mm -hmm. You have randomly chosen users that instead of getting the regular Google search engine, they get to a special engine that's a test engine. So you're well, I can't talk about the details of how Canary works with Google search specifically, but the engineering principle is, is absolutely. If you have five things you want to push, um, make a grid of every possible combination of them and set up set up some experiments or something like that. Right? I don't know the details of what exact of the details of how search pushes have changes like that. Um, but the general engineering principle is exactly that. Choose people at random and watch what's going on, and they will report bugs faster, especially if they. 
especially if they're like internal engineers or something like that. Um, okay, so that's, and, and in fact I'm pleased that, that uh, Canonical has announced that they're going to start doing this, they're going to start doing the first half of this, of Canaries, not the second half, for new stable updates. They're going to do a rolling release process, a rolling, what is it being called? I forgot the name. No, the rolling release is something else. But right. They're, they're going to push updates that way. They're going to push. Right, they're going to push updates to small percentages. Watch for bugs before they push it to everybody. Right. So they they don't they don't have yet a mechanism for backing it out quickly. That's that's much harder than that. Yeah. But it at least lets you mitigate the problem and get a, a fix in place quickly. You're saying that the people who get these pushes don't know. Right. Like, I don't know if I entirely can believe that. If they're um, uh, technically advanced people who are going to be filing bug reports, wouldn't they be able to? No. Well, let, let me let me give you an example that's kind of real life. The the team that distributes the compilers for engineers at Google to use um, makes a new change. Um, they they absolutely use exactly this mechanism. And oh yeah, your compiler fails. You you raise alert. Oh my God, the compiler's broken. <laughs> you don't. You, you're not, you don't know that you're a tester, so you react as if the world is falling, rather than, oh, the test had a mistake. But is that like a different version number whenever you, you have no idea that it's a, a slightly tweaked? Every day I am using thousands of pieces of software okay. from all over the world. I would never know that there was a new, that, yeah, the compiler has some little version number in its voluminous output, but I don't even see it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that was, I, I didn't think about that. Like, yeah. Let, let me just offer perhaps something of an answer aspect of what you asked about. There's a theorem that says under the assumption that you don't cooperate, that no two Googlers cooperate, you can't actually tell. I mean, obviously it's a false thing uh, because the assumptions are never satisfied. But um, the answer is if all the Googlers got together and every day ran MD5, SHA-1 on their own, and then they noticed that the updates were different, yes, you could tell, but right. otherwise not. Your question here? Yeah, you said that uh, Canonical does something that you do already at Google. How do you um, feedback into the open source project? Do you have an official channel? Do you push code? In this case, me talking about Canaries <laughs> <laughs> with some of the Canonical Foundation team or core team engineers okay, so caused them to say, I don't know if we can back out changes, but we can start doing this to roll them out better, and then we don't have that cron bug quite as badly as we did, or whatever. There's always a bug, right? Right. That's why they will make mistakes, right? The only way Canonical can make no mistakes is to show, close up shop, and that would be a mistake. So, <laughs> so, so. Um, I mean, we certainly can. That that's right here. I can talk about things that we've done in the open source community in general. I mean. Google's a major contributor to Linux and Puppet and Ruby and Python. And I just want to add one more question. Do yeah. you prescribe hardware to your users? Do they have yes, they have. The Ubuntu is running on company supplied hardware, and there's a limited range of choices. Yeah. yeah your, they, users cannot just run it on their own personal machine. Is Canary a synonym for a dark deployment? Is Canary a synonym for dark deployment? They're very closely related. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a huge amount of overlap in what those terms are talking about. Uh, I just think the term most people would be more familiar with is bucketing, bucket deployments. Right, if you can back it out quickly. Is it, okay, right. is that the, the Canarying is difference? both things. Um, well, some people, when they use bucket deployments, I, I think they, they definitely mean the first half and they might or might not mean the second half, right? So as we use the term canarying, it's also that you can get somebody back onto the working system immediately if, if it's really bad. But, so that's not the distinction that you would make between canarying and dark deployment? No. Um, dark deployment is, does other things besides just canarying. It's one difference. Um, if you have a good canary regime in place, engineers will become more willing to take risks that are of great benefit because they're not as nervous about the potential harm of those risks because you have a great mitigation strategy. Right? Um, testing can never adequately uh, fix all the problems because the, the, the user base uh, is much larger than all you know about testing. And self-selected testers even if they don't have the psychological bug fixing problem, 
are still a special group of people, right? So they will, they will, they will have, they will be demographically different in various interesting ways that will matter to the kinds of bugs you get, right? For example, self-selected testers are probably not working on an immediate, high priority, critical to the company job, <laughs> right? <laughs> They say, I'll sign up for the next test next week. <laughs> um, that means you push changes that are, that means when you do changes, they can have more functionality and they disrupt users less, right? Even if the change is a disaster, it only disrupted a tenth of a percent of the users, which is not that much compared to something else. And then that lets you do much more rapid development cadence. But what about me, you ask? Could you get Kubuntu for yourself? Well, why would you? We don't customize the UI, which is often what people really want to see right off the bat. We don't provide a lot of packages that would do anything useful to you outside of Google. Right? I mentioned our compilers. Well, you know what? It's a special build of Cfront and GCC and the Go standard Go compiler and the whatever. You've already got them in, in ways that are 100% just, just what you have. Or they specially use pieces of our infrastructure that if you had it on your workstation, it wouldn't do anything anyway. And you might want more control over your computer than we give our users. The only thing you'd really be signing up for is that we would own your machine and restrict it in ways you might not like. <laughs> so, okay. But maybe at your site, you are an administrator and you would like to use Kubuntu, can't I do that? Well, the details are not gonna be right. You could do something like it at your site, and most large installations do, right? They have their own mix of what they've done custom and what they've gotten from upstream, depending on when they started, what their other infrastructure is, what their users look like, what their users expect, what they have to integrate with. We don't have to integrate with, with an exchange server. If you have to integrate with an exchange server, you're gonna make a totally different set of decisions about these kinds of things. But hopefully you can manage your systems in this with the same kind of way and the same kinds of techniques. So I hope you can learn something that's useful there from what we do. But, but pay attention to the differences in your environment. By God, don't go back to your manager and say, we need to do it this way because Google does. Say, well, I heard this fabulous talk by this brilliant, funny guy. And I think 1% I think, I think of what he said was a thing we should think about doing and then fit it in with your environment. That's, that's what you need to do, right? Your security challenges are probably different. I wouldn't say less, just different, right? Your user base is probably diverse in a different way from ours, right? Your staffing decisions may be different than ours, right? So it's, it's intelligent engineering, um, and there's no replacement for that. So that's, that's, that's really important. But I still want to use Kubuntu. It's so cool, and I'm a total fanboy. There is, there is one way. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Why no SSL? Huh? Why no SSL? You can. It's up to you. But the, the site works either way. There's not a lot of secret information. Uh, questions? So it's it's sort of related to. Uh, would, you, would you use it? Uh, so, so you have this uh, a, a PPA server, which is, a, which I guess is a user intermediate um, repository. Yeah. Okay. And it sounds like you have this awesome testing thing of unstable, stable, blah blah blah. Yeah. Does your PPA no. do that? And, and so, so getting back to what question was, does our PPA server use the awesome testing we have from this engineering? The answer is no. But. Okay, so supposing one is it, yeah, but you're, this, the same point you were trying to make, well, it, was, it doesn't, you saw some cool sort of apply, you know, if you made them available to those, you, your community could help you with your awesome tools, or they, I mean, they could There's use their own. So the, I, I work in Los Angeles right next to the team that does corporate monitoring at Google. They have some special packages that they roll out to their servers that are in this special PPA, right? Um, they have testing versions, and they use these principles, which is they run their own release engineering of their packages to their machines. Right? So they're using the same techniques, but they're adapting it to their particular case. They don't have the same ratio of machines to engineers that we do. Right? So they have, you know, we have, we have 
30,000 odd users and more than that machines, right? And about the same size team as they have to do all of the monitoring. So the monitoring servers are many smaller in number. So there's more of them per server, which means they can do a more relaxed approach to testing because they have a higher degree of ability to step in and fix. If they had to fix every one of their servers, they could do it. It would be a painful leak because it would be tedious, but they could do it. We cannot, right? My team of, of 16 odd people cannot fix 30,000 machines. Can't, right? So we have to do a degree of testing more than they do. And so we give them the same tools, and then they, they do their, their jobs, what's best for their specific team. Right? That's why the, the messaging at Google is always these broad principles about site reliability engineering, and then pretty much each team now figures out how to apply them for their team correctly. They're not like management directives where the details are all spelled out by some director somewhere. But once, right. that's, once that super cool tool is important enough for a large amount of Googlers to use it, then it's kind of like stepping up from universe to main, then it has to go through. Yeah, uh, no, 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 a lot of, no. The t lots of the teams that deploy things to all of our engineers don't go through us at all. That's just your security, your puppet, your... Yeah, that's just the things that my team does. Yeah. Um, how close are you to um, uh, purchasing and defining uh, um, what's supported? We are responsible for qualifying the hardware. question was, I'm sorry, I should be repeating these. Um, how close are we to purchasing and defining which hardware is supported? Um, we would like to have more control than we do, and we have probably more control than purchasing would like. <laughs> uh, we are responsible for qualifying the hardware. Um, but sometimes the exigencies of the moment means our arm is being twisted, and probably quite reasonably so. So we're running over time. How about one or yeah. two more questions? Yeah, two more. Uh, do you have a sleepless night over what's going on? Do I have what? Sleepless nights. No. Do I have sleepless <laughs> nights? No. <laughs> yeah. Sleepless nights are a version of hope a hand up there without any hope. <laughs> so hand up there back. Yeah, hand up in the back. Ah, yeah, sorry. Uh, how much do you support uh, dual or tri booting in general? And uh, do you support Ubuntu on Macs? Dual booting, tri booting in general, Ubuntu on Macs. We don't support dual booting, and we are not rolling out Ubuntu on Macs. The hardware is more expensive. So, if somebody's going to run Ubuntu, we want to give them the cheaper hardware. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to pay more for hardware, but not use the software that they would get for it if they actually prefer the, the Apple software. And Jay, you have one last question? Sure. It's, it's just pointing out that there was one question. Somebody said, I forgot, it's an issue of how do you prevent people that got root of the machine, how do you prevent them from taking over? Right, from I blocking mean, puppet. I guess, yeah. I guess, well, it's not really a question, it's just a suggestion. Um, how, many, how many iPhones and iPads are there in the world today? Uh, I don't know. Millions, right? Okay, so uh, Apple has root on them, so there's no problem about Apple controlling most of them. <laughs> and these questions are not distinct from the general question of the use of home computers and portable computers by human beings. Um, you know, they, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, it's 30,000, 100 million. There's a similarity. In an environment where there are companies that want to radically restrict what you can do on your own hardware. Right. Um, yeah. All right. I'm going to wrap the questions there and say that we have uh, some book giveaways, so we need some, some uh, trivia questions uh, found. I have some trivia questions. And we have, what we're going to do is this we have um, four physical books and ebook vouchers, uh, that is, uh, three ebook vouchers. So. Uh, as the answers come up, whoever uh, whoever wins can come up and select either a book or a voucher for themselves. All right. So, so this is like Jeopardy. <laughs> if you shout out the answer, you can't get it, <laughs> but you've just given the you've just given it to your neighbor. So the first question is, how do we ban packages? What mechanism do we use to ban packages? Hands. Poppy. Awesome. <laughs> how does how does our puppet keep from being pwned by a bad server? Yes. Use certificates. Use certificates. All right, come on up. 
What's the default desktop on Ubuntu? Unity. Unity. <laughs> what does hope is not a strategy mean? <laughs> yes. It means uh, your system will fail and you have to be prepared for it. Your system will fail and you have to be prepared for it. Hold on. Who is allowed to demand a post-mortem? Yes. Anyone. Anyone. <laughs> All right, we have uh, two more things available after this. Why was the cron bug a particularly special problem? Yes, sir. Use cron in order to update cron. Right. To use cron to update cron. <laughs> How many people do we have to support our 30,000 users? About 16. About 16. <laughs> <laughs> and that wraps up the giveaway. Unless you guys want more, unless you want to give more trivia questions out. I, 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 that's all the ones no that more I wrote. Okay. <laughs> so we should let people escape, but I'm going to go have beers or whatever as we do. So, so uh, yeah, we're going to be at the... Uh, <laughs> West 14th Street, and uh, we hope you'll all uh, join us. And like I said, there'll be people leading groups there so you don't get lost. Or, uh, uh, again, thanks, Thomas. Thank you.